Hello, everyone. I'll try and keep it this as short or as long as you'd like it to be, adding the time. Um, I'll take it by nodding off or people walking out, you're all tired of me. So I just want to uh, make some closing remarks to wrap up today and also invite some comments on those remarks um, if, you, um, if you'd like to. This is not formal, so if you want to jump in and make a, ask a question halfway through or make a comment, please do so. Um, one thing I was going to do today, before we even get into the formal part, is um, just note the passing of Professor Desmond Ball. Uh, I'm sure most people in the room know him. He, he died last night, sadly. He and Coral Bell are probably the denizens of strategy in Australia. Um, Coral Bell School now at ANU. Desmond Ball was at SDSC. And I've been working in strategy in Canberra for some years. And he's been a large, shadowy, looming presence every time I go through ANU. He's always been there, even through his sickness, till, till he passed uh, last night of cancer. Um, so I don't know if all of you know him, but for those who do, it's a sad day for, uh, I suppose, strategy in Australia with his passing. Um, turning back to today, I was sitting there listening and taking a little page of notes here, but the big observation is how rich this day was. I've got to say congratulations to the organisers. It's actually one of the best air power forums I've been to for quite some time, I think, two, for two reasons. A, the breadth of the topics, but also the audience. Uh, the presentations have been excellent, but the audience input's also been excellent, and I'm um, very gladdened as a old strategist that you don't know because uh, I don't get to write publicly. Um, the, uh, even though I do get to write, not publicly. Um, it's very heartening to see the depth of intellectual thought being put to strategy and air power strategy in particular uh, from the audience, whether it's military or uh, academic or just interested civilians. So I think we're in good hands with regard to that. Um, the chief and deputy of Air Force are very aware how important strategy is to Air Force, which is why you're going to see an Air Force strategy come out, which is why Jericho got stood up, uh, which is why people are being posted to strategy jobs, why there's, why there's now an uh, Air Power Scholar scheme being established. So um, strategy in Air Force, is, people who've been around for a while, has been patchy, you know, sine wave, love it, hate it, love it, hate it. I've lived it for over 20 years, loved, hated, loved, hated. Individually, um, there's only been one of me. Um, I hope there's going to be an awful lot more, and that's what this is really all about. So some observations, though, from that perspective. Um, one thing that did strike me was we already know everything. It all came out today. We already know everything. What we need to do is remember we know everything. There's two things. One, remember what we know, because a lot of these lessons you're getting are e eons old. I go back to the Peloponnesian Wars and I wouldn't say anything different, right? They're eons old. Why has nothing changed in that regard? Because people haven't changed. Whilst we stand on the shoulder of giants, war is an act that occurs between people. Whether using machines as proxies or not, the war is between people. It sounds obvious to say it, doesn't it? But boy, we get lost, up, lost in the rhetoric sometimes. Um, if I send an autonomous machine, which, by the way, is not autonomous, I programmed it, to my rules. It didn't program itself. So if I send a machine in, it's a proxy for people. All human conflict is that, human. And you can't get away from it. And you can't distance yourself from it because you're doing a strike with the UAV either, or you're using a machine as a proxy. It's still a human conflict. Humans fight each other. Sad, isn't it? Another thing to remember, and I brought that up in the comment diatribe I made during the presentation on what war is, most of the things that have been discussed today come out of the operational experience of the people in the room or contemporary analysis of that. And that analysis out of the MEAO, for example, is not war. It's conflict. And whilst we've got lots of time in conflict to have a bit of think about targeting, don't we? And, and watch targets for weeks or days or months to choose to strike or not to strike. Does it matter to us? Hell no. We're sitting up there with complete Im immunity, pretty much, just picking off the moles. There's another one, there's another one. Back to your point, it's not a strategy and you can't win doing that. We're going to find that out the hard way. Um, but nonetheless, that's what we've been doing. That's not war. No one's fighting back. So we're, when we're at conflict and we can start having these very deep philosophical arguments about <coughs> ethics and morals, about how we'd prosecute this or prosecute that, when we have time to make those kinds of decisions, that's fantastic. 
But I've got to tell you, if you wind up fighting World War III, that is not how it's going to go. That's the lesson I want you to take away. That is not how it's going to go. If you're in an AO, in a high-end war, and they're coming from that way, and that's the threat axis, there's no thinking about, is that the right target? That's the target. They're going to kill you, or you're going to kill them. And it's going to happen like that. The more preparation you can do in tactics, techniques, um, and procedures, how you structured your force, back to your point, how you've discussed it publicly, very important. But prior to the event, the better prepared you are to deal with those contingencies. But it's going to happen that way. While we live in this disparate world where they're at war and we're in conflict, back to my point, the West hasn't won a war since the end of World War II, because we were at war. Korea was, Vietnam was, the people in the Middle East who are fighting for what they believe, right or wrong, Taliban, right, they're at war, they're fighting for their lives and their homeland and their beliefs. We're not fighting for our home or our lives or our beliefs. We're fighting for an international system that we wish to preserve because it's made us very rich. And those who oppose that system, we built it post-World War II, we paid a big blood price for it in World War II, and having built it and got very rich with it, we do not intend to give it up to anybody. Now, we're prepared to pay a, play a, a, a blood price for that particular uh, decision, but it's not easy for those in uniform, particularly, who have to physically and mentally pay that price. It's not easy because there's ambiguity, and we've heard it all from the, from the room all day. When you're actually at war, there's no ambiguity. And dying for the cause you believe in, the loss of your country in, in this case, that case, is clear that that is something you can accept and you will take casualties. And you won't regret them. You might personally regret them, but systemically you won't because you believed it was the right thing to do. Noting, as I said, war is an inhuman act. Interesting, isn't it, trying to write rules around wars? War is already a failure, i.e. you should have gone through every other thing uh, to remediate the possibility of that war, and if you did and you're still at war, that means every civilised thing you would have done has been unsuccessful, and therefore you're in the last thing, which is physically fighting. And nobody on the planet thinks that's a very clever way of getting what they want. It's not something you choose, but as Tolstoy said, you might be interested in war, but war is interested in you. You don't choose. The adversary chooses. And when the adversary chooses that you're weak, they strike. Funny old thing. Let's just put the last 12 or 15 years of counterinsurgency behind us and let's assume that you're all incredibly clever and sophisticated, which you are, and you have been able to put behind you the lessons I've heard carried forward from that conflict into the next war, if there's going to be one. Let's assume you can do that. You're not assuming the next war is going to be like the last, because no two are ever the same. The judgment I expect out of the military folk and the strategists in the room around that are, is profound. No two wars are the same. No two conflicts are the same. No two enemies are the same. Just because we've been wrapped around the axle for 15 years in counterinsurgency doesn't mean that's what's going to happen next, because it isn't. So let's go back to some principles. That's where you're coming from, I think, and you're quite right, by the way, and have a little think about where we're actually going. What's likely? Having, I step back now from my own white paper. When I did the strategic analysis for this white paper, I completed that just after the 2013 white paper, which I wrote most of. I did the next white paper at the same time as the last white paper. Why? Because I knew we were going to have to, and here we are. But it's meant to come out in 2014, not 2016. And when we did the strategic analysis for the 2014 white paper, now the 2016 white paper, the world was nothing like this. Nothing like it. The strategic white, the white paper in of, this, of this year reflected the world as it was and the one that Australia preferred. If I said three months ago that the Philippines, of all countries in Southeast Asia, would turn its face from America to China, you would have laughed at me. If I'd said and I did say, by the way, in 2012, back to your point, and lost the argument internally. In 2012, I pushed very hard to have the rise of Russia written into the 2013 white paper. I lost. It doesn't mean any great joy to know that I was right. Why am I telling you that story? Because the prejudice that lives inside the mores of the department, inside any large agency, 
particularly a bureaucratic one, are hard to overcome. It doesn't suit, go doesn't suit governments and it doesn't suit large agencies to have uncomfortable truths exposed at times that they don't want to see them exposed. Because there's a big price to that, particularly if they're wrong and they prepare for something that didn't happen. Everyone thinks they're a fool. Wars like that, by the way, if you prepare for a war and you win, you're a genius, strategic genius, yep. If you prepare for a contingency that doesn't come to pass and you spend a lot of money on it, no blood, you're a fool. Is that, the, is that not the nature of insurance? Is that not the military problem? How well insured are you? Um, anyway, back to the white paper. The white paper was written for a more benign world. If I had said that Russia was going to rise again and would stand up in the Crimea, people in 2012 said I was a fool. They're not saying that now. If I said that China, after 300 years, 300 years of being dominated by the West and then re-rising, was going to join Russia in Syria to demonstrate its global reach, if I said that to you three months ago, you would say, you're a fool. Well, guess what? Here we are. If we said that China was going to build two equivalents of RAF-based Tyndall in the South China Sea inside 18 months and will build a third and another six, you would say that wasn't possible. Well, they're doing it. If you were to say that um, the Philippines will do a deal with China as to who owns the South China Sea, two-thirds for them, one-third for the Philippines, you'd say that wouldn't happen. It's happening. Philippines is in first, isn't it? First to turn to China, first deal. They get the most. It's happening. Um, if you were to say, as the Deputy Chief said this morning, so I'm not saying anything out of school, you've got one unelectable and one inappropriate presidential candidate coming forward, for which we unfortunately don't get to vote, neither of whom is going to help solve the problems I'm talking about, you would have said, how could America come to this? But it has. Anyone feeling comfortable? I wouldn't. I don't like being a harbinger of doom, but, uh, but uh, in our job, it's our job to hope for the best and plan for the worst. That's our job. Strategy has been called the dismal science, and that's why it's called the dismal science. Um, if we have to go into conflict and, God help me, war to our north, without naming the name, because that would be inappropriate because I'm in uniform, if we had to do that, that will be a fight like no other in the history of the world. Why do I say that? Because everyone made the joke years ago, there are two kinds of Air Force, the USAF and everybody else. It's true. There are two kinds of adversaries in the world at the moment, China and everybody else. China is not Russia. China's on the inside of our system. China might have different politics. It may be a little aggressive in the South China Sea, they believe they're not being aggressive, by the way. They believe they're being magnanimous. Just go and say anniversary, right? But they are of us. They got rich with us. They are not seeking to oppose the world order. They are not seeking to overthrow the world order. They're not the Soviet Union. They're inside. And they're mobilising at a rate that would be the equivalent of the United States in 1942. So the only two countries in the world can do that right now, the United States and China. Russia can't do it. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? As soon as I said it this morning, I'll repeat it again because we've discussed it muchly, China's preparing for war. It doesn't mean they're going to go to war. All right? That's a very different judgement. But they are preparing for war, and I would say they are 40 or 60%, hard to tell exactly with them, a bit opaque, not surprisingly. They're about 40 or 60% down the road to going from what they were which was brown water, short range, brown water navy, short range air, massive army, no point, to a global, uh, an agency with global reach and high tech weapons. They're not there yet, but given their, their rate of mobilisation, they will be there very soon. I don't mean decades either. They will be there very soon. Now, China's going to rise. It's rising, it's risen. Southeast Asia, Asia is going to rise. It's rising rapidly. If things come to pass, Indonesia will be the third richest country in the world by 2040. We'd like them to be. We want them to be on our side too, for obvious reasons. They own the uh, choke points in the slocks, Indonesia does. If they're not on our side, then Australia's in big trouble. 
Why am I on about this? Because I don't want you to start thinking as to how you strategize your way out of that. Um, this is back to your very good point. It's very uncomfortable to be a senior military officer straight after the release of a white paper where the tenets of that white paper have been largely overturned by self-evident world affairs. Yeah, that's what's happened. Tell me if you disagree. We, the, in the white paper, we don't say it, but we imply it. Australia has not prepared and does not prepare forces for, major, for conflict against major powers. That's not what we're about. That's not what the white paper's about. In fact, I'll put a comma against major powers, comma, particularly nuclear powers. Yeah? I kept writing that line into the white paper, by the way, in 2012 and in 2016. I think I must have written in 10 or 12 times. And 10 or 12 times someone else would take it out, and I'd write it back again, and they'd take it out, and say, Tony, stop putting that in. And I'd go, no, I think that's a, a line the public should actually hear. Australia is not preparing for war against a major power, comma, particularly nuclear powers. That's not Australia's military posture. The government hasn't agreed that. That's not the point, though, for military professionals. Military professionals need to look at the world and go, if I think the world isn't falling the way that it might, what's my obligation to analyse that, at least intellectually, and give the government advice about what the implications of that might mean and what we might do about it? That's a challenge you threw out, actually, and that's exactly right. <coughs> so the role of air power professionals is to think that through and come up with options about what Australia's posture might be and in the Air Force pa paradigm, uh, what air power strategy would sit under that posture. But right now, <laughs> that isn't what we're preparing for. I'm just going to make one more point and I'm done. The point is this. People always, I said before, we are only, only required to remember, and that's true. I did say you're required to remember in the context of the day. Well, the context of the day is nuclear. There were no nuclear weapons in World War II, except at the end. And at the end, they kind of proved kind of decisive in shutting things down. But now, if we go to war against a major power, the world is nuclear. And I've got to tell you, there are limits to conventional force uh, in a nuclear world. Where have you read anything about that lately? Nowhere. Um, you will have read publicly, if you're following, the fact that Putin is very cleverly now posturing tactical nuclear weapons as deterrent, uh, deterrent tools. You read that stuff lately? Wow, there's a terrifying idea. But I hope China doesn't read that, by the way. I'm sure they have. Um, back to my point, I'm not going to make any sense of this for you. You can think it through yourself. I have my own personal views on what that all means, what we might and mightn't do, but it's really for you to think through. I'm simply laying out what the world is without colour. And one more final point, good strategists don't have colour. Yep. You're not colouring the world with your personal view. You're cool and you're calm and you're very collected about what risks and opportunities lay and you're not caught up in the emotion of should I kill that child or not. You're caught up in the requirement to defend the thing your government has told you to defend and professionally you're caught up in the requirement to advise them as to how that should best be done. The rest can come later. End of diatribe. Any questions? Comments? It's got very quiet. When, when we write, write our white papers against a short-term political gain, yep. which is what we do, yep. we're looking at four to eight years. The lucky country, eh? Yeah. Um, and potential future adversaries have been looking at a three, four, five hundred year plan. It doesn't matter what your short-term political gain is, it's your long-term gain. How, how do you strategize? How do you, how do you then look at what, what's, what's going to happen to us, to my grand, not my kids, my grandkids, hopefully, um, in a hundred years' time? Like yeah. that's, that's what we need to be looking at now, because like, what's happening well, elsewhere in the world? Your observation is completely correct. Um, I would say that us and other protagonists, we won't name them directly, even though we, you know who, they, who we're talking about, um, are playing a different game. We're not playing on the same chessboard. We are playing a different tactical. We're playing tactical game, they're playing strategic game, yeah? Um, it's, uh, Australia in that doesn't, has no hand except to shape and engage. We are not going to be the arbiter of an outcome when the, you know, when the elephants dance, um, the, mouse, the mice get crushed, they get out of the way. 
But elephants are scared of mice, apparently. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, that's a story. So if you are a mouse and the elephant's frightened of you, or you have diatribe or a relationship with, with, with an elephant, then our professional responsibility is to help the elephant ex understand that it's in the wrong dance. Our alliance with the US buys us a lot. One of it is a voice. One thing we have is a voice. Our geography is massively important to the US. They'll never leave us. Not while the world re remains in the, in the pattern it is, because our geography is such as it is. We could be as nasty or as nice as we like, and they still want to be here. The point for Australia is twofold. One, if we're going to rely on them to be the keeper of the larger piece in the 100-year game you're talking about, we better have that dialogue with them, which means we have the right relationship to have the dialogue. That's the first point. And the second point is, if we want a particular thing from the United States in Australia's interest, and that's all we want from them, actually, same as what they want from us, um, then we'd better figure out how we're going to bind them here. Not bind them here through geography, but bind them here on our terms. This is real politic now. By the way, good strategists don't play tiddlywinks. We don't sit around talking about ethics all day. What we talk about is the balance of interests. And human happiness? No. That's assuming that this doesn't look <laughs> I'm in the military. I don't do human happiness. There's another department for that, and I'm not joking. Sunu made a very good point this morning. That's as an astute comment, but it's critical. There's a limit to what militaries can and should do. We're not a social experiment. And if you start thinking the military is the new police force, or the military is a new social way of delivering equality in society, or the military is whatever other label you wish to apply to it, I'm afraid you are diluting its primary purpose. And its primary purpose is to assure the peace. When you start looking at everything as a military problem, when it actually is a policing problem or a law and order problem or an international relations problem, but you treat it with a military instrument and you make it a military problem, you're actually playing into the hands of those people who have decided in strategy, very clever strategy by Al-Qaeda, by the way, to go right between military and civil law and divide us internally, and they've done it brilliantly, and we've helped them. Thanks, sir. Not so great, actually. Um, I want your opinion on uh, uh, Dean's presentation. Actually, you spoke about ethics and strategy. Yep. Uh, one containing the other and vice versa. Yep. Um, is it possible that um, one doesn't necessarily contain the other, but they sit on a linear continuum? And there's a sliding scale depending on your level of legitimacy. Yes. And what, um, and, and what factors would lead to where we sit on that scale when, yes. it, when it comes to um, rubber hitting the road? It's an excellent question. Um, and I think your model is, uh, Dean, I've got to say, I prefer his model to yours. Um, not that your model's wrong, it's not. But the way I'd present it from a strategic, analytical, analytical uh, strategic perspective is I would first understand the nature of the conflict that I'm entering. And I have to understand it from a couple of perspectives. A, where it's going to start, and B, where it's going to end. I've got to decide how much effort I want to put up up front to forestalling it, if I think that's, that's the most effective and ethical way of stopping it, which could be bloody and, bloody and fast, yep, or whether I, I wish to allow it to drift and try and close it down at the end. Good strategy would tell you that. And then you start making judgments about what you are prepared to accept or not accept in an ethical sense to actually achieve that end. If your decision is, if you me talking to another country, right? If you do that, we are going to come and fill in the gap, right? And it's going to be really, really ugly. We're going to tell you that up front. We may have the capacity to do that, or we may not. They, we may be playing a deterrent posture. It's going to be credible, though. But we're going to hurt you really badly, and there's going to be serious collateral damage. And we don't care. You're not going to do it. That actually would fall into Klaus Lewitzian's view of make it short, make it sharp. And you have the less suffering, which is just war theory. You have the least suffering by being brutal first, noting that war is brutal. If you wish to drift, as apparently the West does these days, then you've got to adopt a different moral posture. And you're probably ceding the decision superiority space to the adversary, and you get sucked into their, their kind of fight. Sound like any counterinsurgency you might know. Um, which is far more compromising of your own ethical decision making, not your ethical boundaries, didn't say that, than you controlling the pace of decision to your own tempo. So there is no hard answer to your question, but I think your premise and the way you've put it is exactly right. Early force, late ethics, um, <laughs> early ethics, late force, take your pick, but you've got to choose. <laughs>